Please join me in welcoming 2019 Cavazos Award honorees, Jim and Jerry Lynn Burkhart to the stage. Thank you so much for this honor. I cannot believe it. Um, it's really, when Kirk called, I was kind of like Dr. San Francisco. I thought it was a hoax. <laughs> and I said, what? What do you want to do, what? And I said, don't you realize that we're not alumni of Texas Tech? And he said, well, it's the only award we give without you having to be an alumni. I said, but don't you realize my husband is an Aggie? <laughs> they don't like Aggies at Texas Tech. So. But he said, we'll forgive him for that. And uh, so anyway, here we are. And I really appreciate the honor that you've given us. And uh, it's been a blessing to be at Texas Tech. It's been a blessing for us to have been able to provide this center. And you know, sometimes it's easy to give money if you have it, which we haven't always had it, but it's really the people that you around you that do the work and the people that make it possible. And you start at the top, and we've had a few at the top early on that weren't too interested. But let me tell you, the two we have now at the top Chancellor Hans and President Skuvenek are the best. I mean, they are behind us 100%. Chancellor Duncan was that way, and we've just had good people at the top that have really encouraged us and kept us going, and uh, I hope it'll go a long time after we're not on the earth. Uh, so we thank you again, and uh, appreciate the honor. I will let Jim <laughs> Well, all I want to say is thank you. It's, uh, this is a great, it's a great honor, and we receive it hopefully in the spirit in which it's offered. And uh, while we're not alums, you know, Geraldine attended Hardin Simmons, and I attended that um, a little school down on the Brazos. <laughs> and by the way, Mike, San Francisco, you would never have had to worry about me being in your honors college. <laughs> so. so uh, but, but nevertheless, this tech means, has grown to mean a lot to us, not just the center, but the whole spectrum of Texas Tech University. We're very proud to be a part of it uh, in our own way. And so we thank you very much, and uh, we uh, just keep, keep our guns up for Texas Tech. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, since its opening in 2005, the Burkhart Center for Autism Education Research has made significant progress, not only in autism research, but in educating and training teachers and caregivers to give them the tools to better benefit individuals on the spectrum, and the center has become a national model. Is this what you envisioned 14 years ago? Well, I not to the extent that it has grown, you know, I started out, I just wanted to be able to train teachers, special ed and regular ed teachers, 
to know what an autistic child is like, and it needs lots of different, you know, uh, approaches in the classroom. I spend a lot of time at a public school every year with Colin because he's nonverbal and he was autistic. And after we finally got him diagnosed, because at the time we got Colin, uh, which is, I want to thank his dad for that. His mother is deceased and his dad was willing to let us take him because he knew that he needed a stable environment and a lot of uh, therapies. And um, so, but at the school system did not know much about autism. I think the only thing they knew was um, the movie Rain Tree or Rain Man, Rain Man. And when Jim first heard the word autism, he thought I said artistic, artism or something. He didn't know what I was talking about because I'd taken Colin to the doctor and he had been diagnosed. But anyway, um, I spent a lot of time at public schools up until around December helping the teacher know how to deal with Colin. And I didn't know very much myself at the time, but we were trying to educate ourselves. Anyway, uh, that's what we started. And we met Robin Locke at a tailgate at a ball game. And she asked me about Colin, and I told her that, that we'd been talking in Tulsa to the University of Tulsa and uh, about starting a program. And uh, she said, would you be interested here? And I said, oh, yes, we would. And boy, in about two weeks, she had a proposition, a proposal, and had, us, had our name on the dotted line and had our money. So, <laughs> and so, you know, but it's what it takes, and uh, she, uh, she was the instigator, and, uh, and then the, uh, which something I had never thought of is after an autistic child gets out of high school, there's nothing for them, and yet that they're, at some point, sometimes that's when they really start learning, and uh, she suggested a transition program for students that graduate from or leave high school, and uh, because a lot of them are very smart, but they have poor social skills, and maybe they don't even have good uh, living skills. And um, she said, you know, these, these children or these students could really, uh, you know, learn to have a job and, and become independent. And then she hired Janice Magnus, and let me tell you, that lady has been a wonderful, <laughs> She, I give full credit for the success of our center because she came to work and she has a heart for these students and she is so good with them and they love her and she has magnificent stories to tell. I mean, really good stories of success. These kids are working all over Lubbock. They have jobs. They're, some of them are living independently. They're learning to drive. This is something that they never thought they could do, and yet they're very, very smart. And uh, but she teaches them social skills, and they have we have job trainers and all, and it, it's been a great success. And then Wes Dotson came on board, and believe me, he's been a, a tremendous person too. And we just have good people, and that's the, that's the secret of our success. And Yes, I didn't envision this. I didn't envision a building. I just wanted a, a you know, a, a, maybe a um, program in a, in a college of ed to help teachers. So it's exceeded that. I w in, in two th mentioning the building in 2013 when the university broke ground on the Burkhart Center, uh, you said the search for answers and how to diagnose Colin those early years were difficult. And you added, mm -hmm. We wanted a place that future parents could go and have a diagnosis and get help and be trained to help their child. First, I would say, just based on what you just said, the fruits of that maybe yeah. frustration have helped countless people in the last 14 years, and that definitely deserves our praise to you and, and applause. That is...
But the, the, the search for uh, answers for Colin started this process. How does he continue to inspire you and others? Oh, my goodness. That young man is the sweetest young man. He's nonverbal. Believe me, he gets his message across <laughs> one way or another. He is now 34. We got him when he was two. And um, he doesn't, he can't speak, but he does communicate. And everyone that's around him loves him. And he loves people. And, um, you know, he just inspires us to keep going. And um, I think it's the reason we're so happy in Lubbock, Texas. It's because Colin, he's happy. <laughs> and uh, he, the, he loves going to the center. And uh, they call it Collins Building, and he knows what it means. He understands that it, he thinks it's Collins Building when he goes <laughs> in the front door. He takes off running down the halls. He thinks, man, this is my building, and I'm here. He's not very big. He doesn't look 34. He's about 5'5 five, five and weighs about 115 pounds. So he, but he's, uh, he knows where the, the Texas Tech Autism Center is. I say, Colin, let's get up and get ready and go to Texas Tech. And Ben, he is ready to go. So, <laughs> Your advocacy of uh, autism research and support goes well beyond Texas Tech University and the communities uh, you call home. And we're glad you do call Lubbock home. Yeah. The center, as I mentioned a moment ago, is a national model. And in 2017, Faulkner University in Montgomery, Alabama, reached out to you and, the, and Texas Tech about moving forward with a similar center. And last year, Geraldine Faulkner bestowed on you a Doctor of human, Humane Letters for your contributions to the development of autism education. What does it mean to both of you to see the far-reaching impact of your efforts? Man, it's amazing. That was a big surprise. Let me tell you, we, uh, we got involved with the Faulkner University many years ago. We had a grandson who had a scholarship, baseball scholarship there. And uh, he called his granddad one day and he said, our baseball team needs uh, uniforms and said, we're looking for donations. And so guess what? Granddad sent a nice big check and uh, <laughs> we got on their list, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, we became good friends with the president, and he comes down every year uh, to our ranch and uh, with his bird dogs and hunts quail. And so they invite us up to their big uh, yearly gala to, to raise money. And um, we went up to this last year, and um, much to my surprise, this was tremendous surprise for me. Uh, in fact, the Prime Minister of uh, England was there. The ex-Prime ex Minister, <laughs> excuse me, and um, to speak. And I was getting ready to hear his nice speech. And they came to get me and they said, come go with me to the st up to the stage. And I said, why? What for? And I said, just come with me. So I went and they bestowed on me this great honor. And uh, I was never so shocked in my life, but I was much appreciative of it. And, and then I looked around and they brought, they had flown all of my children, my three children and their spouses, up and Janice to uh, Alabama and to be there. And it was a great honor, great honor. I don't know that I deserved it because everything I've done is out of the love for Colin. <laughs> so it's been a, a nice task. I don't know. Uh, but, I, I'm, but the new president, I'm going to go ahead and tell this story, why they were so interested. The president that we first met retired. The new president has an autistic son. And so he was interested in a program. And uh, he wanted to come down here and see our center. He was very impressed. And then uh, Janice and uh, Wes went to Alabama and they worked with them and helped them, you know, decide what they needed. And um, they have proceeded on and now they're building a building and they have a wonderful program started. And there's nothing in Alabama anywhere. Nobody had any, in Alabama, there was no help for any autistic.
child. So uh, this is great, great for them and, uh, and uh, for Alabama also. So I should let Jim talk. <laughs> Jim, you're good? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you both hail from the metropolitan area of Hamlin. <laughs> yes. Is that a suburb of Abilene? Is that? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, Abilene is a suburb. Sa oh, I'm oh, sorry. I got it backwards. Sorry. Uh, you're both raised in hardworking families who believed in education. How did your upbringings form your feelings toward helping others and giving back? You want to answer that? Okay. Well, I think, I think it's, uh, we were both raised in wonderful homes with wonderful parents and it was their way of life to tithe to do what to uh, uh, give contributions for this and to help that and none of them had, had a lot of money but they still what they had was always there to be shared with people that needed so we were just we were raised in that atmosphere I mean it was a uh, it was second nature that if we had an opportunity to help some, you know, to do some good and help something, uh, we just by by nature wanted to do it. So that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good enough. Uh, so Jim, this was shared with me um, yesterday, and, and the guy laughed when he said it. So if it's not funny, I'm only quoting it. Jim's first job was in Odessa as an engineer. Then he quickly moved on to high society Tulsa oil. <laughs> but as mentioned earlier, you were a junction boy under Coach Bear Bryant. And uh, are there any moments during that time that, that you reflect on during your career and any lessons from that that played a role in, in your and Geraldine's support of autism research? I can't really say that there were any any uh, moments there that would have affected our outlook or feelings toward uh, autism or autism research. Like I say, I didn't even know what the word was. I had no idea. I think the main thing it did, it, it sort of, uh, you know, let's face it, I, I wasn't any Hall American by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but it, it sort of taught me to get knocked down and kind of get up and dust off and get back up and go do it again, you know. And I think that kind of followed me through through some, well, for instance, some difficulties during in my business career. I had a difficulty or two, which uh, would have been easy to just smooth away, but, you know, I got back up again. So uh, I think that's the main thing. As far as our, our outlook toward our autism, I think that came about much more due to, I think, our upbringing and the need that we saw, and especially for that, that little two-year-old autistic boy. I, 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 I tell people how important things are that you never think about. This little boy, who's now a young man, you know, he's a little autistic boy, and he wouldn't impress you very much, and you wouldn't do anything. But he has probably touched more lives than all the rest of our family and our friends and everything put together. Uh, because without Colin, I have to admit, I doubt that there would be a Burkhart Center. And, uh, uh, but because of, pro of Colin... It, uh, all of these things have transpired, and uh, I think that it, it, he's an amazing young man, a very sweet-spirited, affectionate young man, and uh, as I say, he's touched the lives of more people than we have any idea, I think. so. You know, God works in a strange way sometimes. Uh, he's nonverbal. He's happy. But the, God has used that young man through us for this center and with like Jim said without him there would be no center we would never have been interested in autism and um, and you know God has blessed us we haven't always had money but we always said that if we did we wanted to do something with it 
and we were our plan was to help others because we struggled to get through college and um, we said if we ever had money we're going to help other students it, to go to college and but little did we know that we would have a, a nice, sweet, autistic grandson and that would even do bigger and better things with our money. And, um, but God has used him, and he's brought the best people to us in our center. And a lot of prayer has been gone into this through the years because I really believe that, that God answers prayer when you ask for good people to be sent in, you know, to apply for the jobs or to find the good, the right people that have a heart for autistic children and Asperger's children, any, all of them on the spectrum. And it, it runs the gamut from a very low uh, young man like we have who's nonverbal and to the very intelligent Asperger's and that we have students that come to our, to the center that are in Texas Tech, and they're taking classes. And we've had the students to come over and say, don't tell my parents I'm over here, but I know I need help with social skills. I need to know how to, to interview for a job because I know that I'm lacking in that area. They have figured out that they are on the Asperger's, the high end of autism, and they, they get that help. And then we've had students who didn't think they could ever learn to drive or to cook or to live by themselves. And they're doing that now. And I, I, won't, I keep urging Janice to write a book. There are so many good stories. <laughs> I mean, really good stories about these students through the years. And um, some funny stories, some very successful stories, a few sad stories, but basically um, she just needs to write that book. She'd make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, like I say, takes good people, good staff, and we've had uh, about four or five staff members now for a long time. I don't know that they've gotten a raise since they've been on our. <laughs> but I'm working on that, Janice. <laughs> <I'd> <laughs> but anyway, just takes money. So just keep the center in mind if you ever get, you know, a generous feeling about <laughs> with your money. <laughs> but she's talking about the people, and that is true. I look out there and I see some people. For instance, one person that has been always been a very positive factor for the center is sitting right here at this table, Stacy Poteet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> she has an autistic son, by the and way. And <laughs> Stacy has a, you know, she has a... Uh, a dog in the hunt, so to speak. <laughs> she has an autistic son, but she also has compassion and, and a heart for trying to do the things that are being done at the center. Mm -hmm. And she's been very, a very important part of it. So thank you, Stacy. Yeah, we have some wonderful people at Texas Tech that have really made it a success, really. And uh, like I say, I think the Chancellor, the President, and a lot of others here that have really been supportive and kept it going. You mentioned all the lives that Colin has touched, but I think it's, uh, we would all here agree that uh, through your faith, commitment, and generosity have touched many, many lives more than you can probably know. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank my family for coming. <laughs>